Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my family of origin this morning. I'm going to go back a generation. My father, Alan, was the third of, the second, I'm sorry, of three children. There was David, there was Alan, and there was Lynn. And my Uncle David and my dad, Alan, could not have been more different from one another. David liked to talk a lot, and my dad was, was pretty quiet. Um, David was bookish, while my dad spent most of his time growing up outside, especially on the boat. Uh, David, since day one, was, was pretty sickly. Uh, my dad was fairly healthy uh, growing up. David smoked his whole life, and my dad my dad didn't. Um, from a very early age, David was, David was mean, and he was uh, a bit of a bully to, to Alan and Lynn. Um, uh, my, my grandmother adored Alan, but for whatever reason, kept, kept David at arm's length. Needless to say, as you can imagine, in a household like this, David and Alan didn't get along very well. Uh, growing up, I can count the number of times I saw my uncle. Uh, they would talk just a few times a year, and, and when they talked on the phone, uh, Dad was always tense, and the call usually ended fairly quickly. When David would come to Pittsburgh, he and his wife, uh, my, my Aunt Nancy, they had moved away uh, early on after, soon after they were married, they'd moved to York, PA, about four or five hours away. When he would come home, they would, they would get together at my aunt's house, but we wouldn't stay all that long. I remember, I remember we left pretty quickly. It, it was a strained and difficult relationship and and every time David's name came up up until the time that uh, till the day he died in conversation th there was a, there was this tangible anxiety and and sort of tension and stress in the air families are complicated is that, is that true for any of you families are an intricate and complex system of generational, of cultural, and developmental parts that impact all of the members inside the system, all of the members of the family. The past impacts the family today. Uh, there's an author and a pastor, his name is Pete Scazzaro. He says, Jesus might be in your heart, but grandpa's in your bones. And what that means is that past generations, the way that they parented, the way that they lived, the choices they made, impact and impacted and were passed down from generation to generation. How many of you who have children can remember saying, I'm never going to say that to my kids? I'm never going to talk about my dad to my children to my children the way my mom and dad made me only to find yourself in the heat of the moment talking to your kids the same way and saying to your kids the same way that your folks said to you that's that is a generational family system at work a generational family system is the way that your parents got along with their siblings sometimes impacts and impacts the way that you might get along with, with your siblings as well. There's a generationalness to it. There's this, there's this thing called epigenetics, which is the study of how past trauma and behavior from generations in the past actually change the genetic makeup of later generations. Studies have found that the Holocaust altered survivors' chromosomes causing similar trauma responses generations later in their children who were completely removed from that experience. Imagine that on a smaller level. 
the way your great-great-grandfather may have behaved may be, may be imprinted on you and your DNA today. This is past generations impacting us, the family system today. Culture impacts our family systems. If television has taught me anything, it's that families should look and act like the Waltons, the Brady Bunch, the Huxtables, or the Tanners. Families should always enjoy being together, always be close, and always resolve any conflict once and for all in about 30 minutes in some sort of heartwarming and funny way, and then we'll never ever talk about it again after that point. Facebook has perpetuated this cultural expectation to the millionth degree. How many of you join me in posting pictures of your families on Facebook, Facebook and everybody looks happy? But with my iPhone, I can take a million pictures at one time and the pictures before the one I picked, there's a pretty good chance that everybody's fighting and screaming and yelling at each other and you get that one click where everybody looks perfect. That's the one we post because there's a cultural expectation that family is supposed to get along and supposed to be beautiful and happy the way it is, especially when it feels like it's fallen apart. Family systems have rules that everyone's expected to follow. The hard part is those rules aren't written down and they're usually unspoken. You're just supposed to know them. These rules direct the roles we have in the family, the way we deal with conflict in the family, the way we talk about the family, how we're to act outside the family, and what we're allowed to share with others besides the family. Lastly, these family systems, they're impacted by the ways individuals in the system remember and interpret events that happen to the family. Older siblings are gonna have different memories and a different perspective and a different interpretation than younger ones. Our, our oldest son, Samuel, he has different memories and interpretations of those memories than my youngest daughter, Maddie. Samuel experienced my parenting much differently than Maddie because of the stage of life I was in because of the rigid expectations of what I had for the family, of how my children were supposed to behave, or how I was supposed to behave. Maddie got away with stuff and got to do things that Samuel didn't, not because Maddie was better than Samuel, but because of me. And all of that impacts the way each of them, everybody in the family, interprets what happened to the family. Does any of this ring true for you or is it just me? Does any of this sound familiar? Families are complicated. Well, friends, we are in the third week of our Eastertide sermon series, Christ is Risen. Well done. We're calling this series Living the Resurrection where we're thinking about and preaching through and talking about the implication of what Jesus' resurrection means for us. See, the resurrection is central to our identity as followers of Jesus. Paul says if there is no resurrection, then this is just a big cosmic joke. But instead, we believe that resurrection is real, both for Jesus on Easter morning and for us as followers of Jesus. And we're called to live our resurrection lives, not just in the future when Christ returns, but here and now in every aspect of our lives, from our jobs to our relationships to our bodies, even our finances. Was, as you can guess, today we're going to talk about what resurrection might look like and mean for our families. 
So to do that, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles right to the beginning, the book of Genesis, chapter 32. It's on page 33 in those black books in front of or underneath your seats. And while you're getting to Genesis 32, I'm going to set the stage for you. Back in chapter 12 of Genesis, God came to a man named Abram and said to Abram, go from your country and your family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make of you, Abram, a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. He says, I will bless those that you bless. So Abram did just that. Eventually, Abram's name, God changed Abram's name to Abraham, and he had a son named Isaac, and Abraham blessed Isaac. He passed God's blessing that God had given him on to his first son, Isaac. Isaac married a woman named Rebekah, and she had twin boys, Esau and Jacob. And from the very beginning, even before they came out of the womb, Esau and Jacob's relationship was complicated. Through a series of underhanded and dishonest events, Jacob ended up stealing the blessing that Esau was supposed to get from Isaac. All that God had promised Abraham that he passed down to Isaac was supposed to go to his oldest son Esau, but instead Jacob receives this blessing. As a result, in chapter 27, Esau vows to kill his younger brother Jacob. So Jacob flees his brother's wrath, and for 20 years, he experiences the promises of the blessing. He has a big family. He grows very wealthy. There comes a point, though, where his life is threatened, and he decides he must return home. As he makes his way back home, Jacob is fearful of what, how Esau is going to behave, so he sends gifts ahead of him and his family, gifts of, of, of his herd and of his wealth to Esau, hoping to assuage his brother's anger. The gifts, though, are returned without a word from Esau just a report that Esau is coming to Jacob and he's bringing with him 400 men. And Jacob sends his wives and his children out ahead of him across the river Jabak uh, just in case Esau decides to strike first in his anger, Jacob will be able to escape. We're gonna pick up the story at chapter 32, verse 24. Jacob was left alone, and a man came out of nowhere and wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled him. Then the man said to Jacob, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So the man said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Verse 29, then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But the man said, why is it that you've asked my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Uh, don't close your Bibles. Just stop there for a moment. Don't close anything. This is a very strange story. Jacob is all alone, and suddenly out of nowhere, he's attacked by an unnamed assailant. They wrestle throughout the night, neither gaining the upper hand. And when the morning sun breaks, the stranger strikes Jacob's hip, giving him a limp. Even in his pain, he doesn't let go, but the man's a blessing. The stranger gives him this new name, Israel, and a blessing. And, and Jacob believes that in this moment, he has wrestled with God and names the place, I've seen God face to face, yet my life is preserved. Look at chapter 33. 
Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming and 400 men with him. So he divided his children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself, Jacob, went on ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brother. Stop there again. Instead of cowering in the rear of the processional, after his encounter with this unnamed man, Jacob limps to the front, bowing seven times in deference to his brother. I believe Jacob goes fully expecting the full force of Esau's vengeance to come down on him. I think he goes expecting he's going to die. I look at 33 verse 4. But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Instead of death, Jacob receives forgiveness. Instead of being put down once and for all, Esau restores his brother as family. There's a few things I want to note in this passage. First, is we're only getting half the story. We get Jacob's end of the story. We don't get Esau's. And in that story, Jacob is the perpetrator. Jacob is the bully who takes advantage of his brother. Next, Jacob breaks the family rules of order and loyalty by stealing Esau's blessing. But his deception is generational. Both Abraham and Isaac lied to protect themselves and took matters into their own hands to force God's blessing on their time, not God's. Jacob was ready to sacrifice his family to preserve his own life. Until that is, he wrestles with God at the river's edge And the encounter with God leaves him transformed, both physically with his limb, but also with his new name, Israel. Instead of cowering behind his family, Jacob humbles himself, asking his brother for mercy mercy as he approaches to receive whatever comes. And what comes is, is not what he expected. We don't know Esau's story for those past 20 years, but we do know that he too was blessed. He doesn't need whatever Jacob tries to give him. More than that, though, Esau's identity is not wrapped up in the cultural expectations of him around shame and honor, having been lied to by his brother. He had every right to kill him, but he doesn't. Instead, he envelops his estranged brother and welcomes him back into the family without payment or account for his behavior, without speaking a word of contrition. Uh, Jacob is shown grace upon grace upon grace. And Isaac, the father, his life, he dies in chapter 35. Uh, And it says this, it says, And Isaac breathed his last, he died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days, and his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. It's a beautiful story of, of reconciliation and of healing of this relationship. What does Esau and Jacob have anything to do with resurrected, resurrected families? Well, first, there are no unspoken rules, no generational baggage, no cultural expectations that are bigger than or beyond God's ability to resurrect and make new. There is no family rule, no generational baggage, no cultural expectation that are bigger than or beyond God's ability to make new. Since Adam and Eve rebelled in the garden, the world has known nothing but violence upon violence upon violence. Esau had every right to continue that violence because of Jacob's lies and disloyalty. 
Instead, though, both Esau and Jacob were transformed. Their relationship was resurrected to something new. Next, before we can move forward with new life in our families, we will have to wrestle with God. Before we can move forward with new life in our families, before Jacob could meet Esau, he needed to wrestle with the Lord. That's going to look different for each of us. That might look like confession to a trusted friend. It might look like therapy with a professional. It might look like praying for your family in ways you've not prayed before. Lastly, I want to tell you this. Esau and Jacob's story is not prescriptive, but descriptive. Some family relationships cannot be healed, cannot be resurrected or made new on this side of heaven. Pastor Jason has preached many times on the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation, right? Forgiveness is giving up my right to revenge. And as author Frederick Buechner says, revenge is the hardest thing to give up because it tastes so good. He says this, to lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll your tongue over the prospect of bitter confrontation yet to come, to savor the last toothsome morsel of the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back, in many ways is a feast fit for a king. The chief drawback, though, is what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is is you. Uh, This is an aside. In in 12-step programs in in AA, when they talk about uh, resentments and having resentments against someone, uh, it's it's like uh, drinking poison expecting the other person to die. It's the same thing. Our revenge is the skeleton, is, is me feasting on myself. Forgiveness, giving up that right to revenge, is how we stop wolfing down ourselves and return both ourselves and the other to humanity. Now, now reconciliation, on the other hand, is a restoration of a relationship. No, we are called in Scripture, Jesus invites us to forgive. But God promises that God is the one who brings about reconciliation. Uh, there's this uh, theologian, this New Testament scholar named Scott McKnight. And Scott McKnight says about the first hour in heaven. He says, in the first hour in heaven will mean mass reconciliation at the deepest level. Realizations of truth, reception of truth, and reconciliation with others in that truth. It will mean some kind of admission and confession and embrace of God and others as we experience grace and forgiveness and reconciliation. See, reconciliation, restoring relationships, it's, it's a fragile, incomplete, and imperfect thing this side of heaven. But God promises resurrection. God promises that all things will be made new. God promises reconciliation. Everything will be reconciled to God. What Jacob and Esau do, what the story of Jacob and Esau do is invite us to forgiveness and to trust that God will somehow, someday, some way, either on this side of heaven or the next, bring about God's promised resurrection. Uh, Dad died about three years ago, and and the last time that I had with him uh, when he was alive, we talked about what was to come next. 
Uh, I can remember when my, when my grandmother was dying, my dad told her over and over again, resurrection is coming, resurrection is coming. And, and I shared with him, with my dad, how like him I held on to that promise of resurrection and that in the end, God will resurrect. God will make all things new. All that is broken will be fixed. All that is sick will be healed. All that is dead will receive new life. My dad asked me, does that include my brother David? Which shocked me, because dad was in the throes of dementia. Uh, he, he was in and out. And in the midst of this conversation, my dad was asking about his brother. I said, yeah, I believe it does, dad. And my dad wept. They weren't tears of pain and anger, but they were tears of relief, of hope, and of joy for something new to come for David and Alan. Uh, friends, the invitation for us this morning is to wrestle with God by speaking the truth of our family stories that still haunt us. The invitation is to offer forgiveness and work towards reconciliation as best we can on this side of heaven, trusting that one day God will bring healing and resurrected life to all the broken and dead places in God's creation, including our families. Would you pray with me? Uh, God, families are hard. They're difficult. They're complicated, Lord. Uh, there is pain in our families that goes back generations. Uh, that we might not even realize that's what it is. Uh, Lord, this morning, maybe just for a moment, would you give us a glimpse of what forgiveness and reconciliation might look like? Maybe that's the courage we need this morning. It's just, it's just a glimpse. What might resurrection of our family relationships look like? Trusting, Lord, trusting that one day, hoping that one day, believing that one day, on this side of heaven or next, Lord, you will make all things new. We ask all this in the precious name of Jesus as together we say, amen.